It happens in every game. An enemy has found themselves next to a ledge or environmental hazard. Your player, on the other hand, has a rope, lasso, manacle, steel chain in hand, or nearby. Or maybe the enemy is too close to killing a fellow party member and the player is desperately trying to engineer their friend's survival. They hit you with the obvious question, can I grapple them? Howdy folks, Gelatinous Roop here. We're returning to the most important D&D rules you missed. Last time, we chatted about one-to-one -one time and its value to all campaigns of every size and producing a more interesting game. Today, we're talking fisticuffs, grappling, pommel strikes, and pummeling to your heart's content. I'm gonna warn you folks now, these rules may seem esoteric and incomprehensible, but they can be pasted onto every single edition of D&D. Yes sir, even 4th edition, I hear you in the back, along with both editions of Pathfinder. We're gonna discuss the basics, tell you about the table's broad effects, why you should use this grappling system in your games, and finally, get to some objections. Now back in 1st edition, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, page 72 of the Dungeon Master's Guide, is a set of rules for adjudicating unarmed or weaponless combat. You only need to know how to do one thing in order to participate in unarmed combat. Roll percentile dice. There are a ton of noodly details, extra procedures based on multiple combatants, how the rules interact with initiative, modifiers on dice rolls, which is about half of the grappling section or the unarmed section, and you don't need to worry about any of those until you actually make the roll. We'll get into specifics and reasons why later, but just remember, if you want to use the system properly, the second you want to grapple someone or hit someone or knock them to the ground, roll those dice. Now let's give you a brief idea of what unarmed or weaponless combat actually does, just to get everyone on the same page. Number one, this mode of combat lets you deal non-lethal damage to opponents. Your total damage is split between lethal and non-lethal, and non-lethal damage is recovered, usually at about one hit point per round. But number two, it lets you stun opponents on high rolls. Number three, it offers a chance to deal repeat damage at a single round. And number four, it lets you increase the chance of you and your allies succeeding on subsequent attacks, weaponless or otherwise. Now let's go over the unique quirks of the weaponless tables, then we'll move on to pummeling, grappling, and overbear attacks. First, Gygax recommends a procedure by which the attacker and defender roll a die, d6 and d4 respectively, to add or subtract to the roll to pummel, grapple, or overbear, or the table result for any of these actions. Monsters, he clarifies, are able to engage in grappling depending on how intelligent they are and the ways in which they'll do it. Grappling midair generally causes both opponents to plummet to the ground in aerial combat, and Gygax actually lists a bunch of different strategies different monsters will use for grappling in aerial combat. The Quaddle, for instance, will ensnare its airborne enemy, force both of them to plummet to the ground, and turn ethereal just before impact, avoiding all of the damage themselves and making their opponent bear the brunt of the fall damage. The attention to detail Gygax offers is insane, and it's all gameable. Another quirk, unless a roll stuns a monk or otherwise makes them helpless, the monk can still attack just fine, just as we'd expect them to, even if they've been affected by a grapple, pummel, or overbear attack. And what are we rolling for exactly? What is the structure of the grappling attacks? All the following tables are based on percentile rolls, just like we said earlier. What you probably weren't expecting was that there's a bunch of tiny, insane modifiers to each and every roll. Each table has their own list of small modifiers to add to your percentile roll. Stuff like using a mailed fist or a metal pommel in a pummel attack, whether the defendant is using a shield, whether they're hasted, what's your strength score, what's the opponent's height, but all the modifiers are different between different types of weaponless attacks, so we'd better get to the first on our list. 
Pummeling. Fisticuff smacking your opponent around is a ton of fun. Big tree logs and huge swords are devastating if a giant is wielding them, but instead of winding up a huge implement to start swinging about, what happens if a giant or a freak just straight up punches you? You better have a high dexterity. The coolest part of punching is the fact that you can keep doing it. Gygax says the players will pummel about twice per round. Furthermore, several of the results allow you to just keep trying to beat the hell out of whatever it is you're attacking. All of the other results for what happens when you pummel just knock the person off balance in addition to their damage. The highest rolls stun your opponent, once again making it easier to take out your opponent. Now when it comes to grappling in other editions, either the process is simple and the outcomes are straightforward, or the process is complicated and the outcomes are still simple and straightforward again. Not so in first edition. Here you can force each other to the ground, there are additional interactions with bites and bear hugs, bears can literally bear hug you here and the opponent's height and weight are factored in. See the DMG's cover there? That lady's been grappled. And due to the height and weight difference, she's toast. Each result for your percentile dice is paired with a few different descriptions that might apply to your grapple. Gary preferred abstractions when it came to the moment-to-moment -moment play. We don't pay attention to every thrust and parry in normal combat, after all. But I think he, or whoever was eventually responsible for these results, recognized that grappling can intermingle with many of the attacks employed by monsters. Check out 41 through 45 here. A hand, a finger lock, or a bite. I want every prospective adventurer listening here to think, are there any monsters in D&D who use bite attacks? Or the result for over 95, kick knee or gouge. Are there any monsters who use their hands to impressive effect? Claw attacks, maybe. I don't think it's a stretch to say the effects of claw or bite attacks will carry over to claw or bite attacks and grappling. Would a vampire wrestle you to the ground before sinking its teeth into your neck? Would a ghoul close the distance to bear hug you before raking its claws across your back? Y'all tell me if that makes sense. Now, overbearing attacks are made to knock your opponent to the ground and follow up with either a grapple or a pummel attack. Now, y'all can still have stuff in your hand, including shields and weapons, and this is another table where hide and weight are factored in. I discovered something interesting along the way. See, most of the results of the overbearing attack table affect your opponent's effective height. It knocks you down to your knees, your hands and knees, then prone. But then look over at the grappling table. There are modifiers, as we mentioned, for differences in height. If you all knock someone down, even partially, it makes overbearing attacks from other people more effective. Moreover, there's an asterisk at the grappling table saying that height is halved for adjusting grappling while prone. Now, I'm pretty confident that knocking someone to their knees or hands and knees counts as a height adjustment for overbearing attacks. It might not count for grappling, but we're gonna save that for another day. Just know there's a bunch of weird interactions here. You know what, not even weird interactions. Intentional game design that produces a loop of decisions, choices that are reliably effective from round to round or from scenario to scenario. All right, so let's talk about why we like this system, why we think it deserves to exist. First up is alternative combat systems. These are good for the same reason that weird and unintuitive subsystems are. In fact, I originally had a section for subsystems in this script. I want you all to imagine the enlarged, reduced spell in Dungeons & Dragons. Now, in 5th edition, your dimensions are doubled, your weight is multiplied by 8, and your attacks with enlarged weapons deal an additional 1d4 damage. Oh, and you all have advantage on strength checks and saving throws. Reduce just reverses the effects. Or rather, produces the reverse of these effects. Now let's take the enlarged spell, which is reversible, in 1st edition. It hasn't changed all that much, it still makes things bigger or smaller. But think of how important it becomes in a game or in a mode of combat where height and weight have an impact on combat. Suddenly, your wizard or whoever they cast a spell on is using flying elbows and putting ogres and armbars thanks to enlarge. 
Meanwhile, the reverse of this spell lets your party wrestle the Afrida on the DMG's cover and help the thief he's holding escape. Encumbrance suddenly has an impact on this system as well, it's part of your weight after all. Height and weight would be kind of dumb to worry about in a standard combat system, however, including alternative combat systems in your game allows players and referees alike to leverage details that y'all just thought of as being fluff. One of the more interesting details about the weaponless combat system is how a portion of the damage is real and the rest is just temporary. First edition gave us a very practical procedure to deal non-lethal damage to opponents, complete with advantages and disadvantages. For instance, non-lethal damage is typically healed at a rate of one hit point per round. You have a timer, albeit a slow one, to actually knock out your opponent. And if you play any edition of D&D long enough, you've been in a combat where something important has happened, or didn't happen rather, on a margin as thin as one hit point. Finally, all monsters are awesome. Now, for a lot of folks, designing new monsters is a chore. Either the prospective designer struggles to invent new and cool abilities, or they find themselves having to choose between cool and useful attacks, none of which you want to get rid of. If you want monsters to have a similar level of dynamism to player characters in combat, you'll probably make a monster too complex to competently run, and it'll die just as fast anyways. If only there were some way of giving lots of different monsters a large spread of sort of universal moves or abilities or attacks that still didn't all feel the same, that hooked into, I don't know, their anatomy to determine effectiveness and presence in combat, maybe something that could be used by multiple monsters at once, combined to be more effective. Grappling offers all monsters a new spread of base actions that have crossovers with their existing actions. The beauty of weaponless combat tables is how differently they're expressed between monster to monster. Height and weight and equipment are different from monster to monster, so different options are more or less effective for them. Now, there are plenty of reasons why folks call these tables nonsense over the past 50 years. Not all of them are good reasons, but we might as well admit when folks have a point. First up is clunky percentiles. See, all the modifiers on our weaponless combat tables really start to stack up after a while, and they're not grouped the best. Details like whether your opponent is using an open-faced helmet, a nose-covering helmet, or a closed visor helmet are not as relevant as height and weight, but they're in the same place and their presence is a little weird to begin with. Speaking of height and weight, we're lacking statistics for how tall and heavy monsters are. Then, of course, there's the fact that D&D doesn't do called shots. D&D combat doesn't come with called shots. Gary would fervently emphasize this again and again and again and again. First edition does not support every moment-to-moment -moment parry and thrust, and it's understandable. Nobody wants to deal with AC differences for your arms, head, chest, legs, feet torso-based appendages, we don't really need to worry about special hit point rules for each, but when it comes to grappling, some old school players wanted specific moves to produce specific effects. Well, Gygax didn't go all the way, he chose in my view the better option of setting groups of moves together to have things that would produce similar effects in the same system. Now earlier, we extolled the virtues of an alternative combat system, but as it turns out, some folks hate these things. Everything must fall under a D20-shaped Eye of Sauron or be scoured from the land. Alternative combat systems are admittedly difficult to develop. It can't just work the same way as the existing combat system, lest one be objectively superior to the other. But they can't just run parallel to one another either. There has to be points of obvious crossover between the standard combat system and the more exotic one. And while this may sound unintuitive, the alternative combat system has to be more complex, less intuitive than the standard combat system. All right, all right, that last one bears some explanation. See, players need to learn whatever the standard combat system is and have it down pat to avoid dragging down the table. 
This process of becoming a good player takes time. If there were multiple combat systems competing for an identical slice of gameplay, it would mess with the play structure. Given the alternative combat system is supposed to have a different niche or focus on different elements of combat, it's also likely to reward players who use it more often than the standard one. This is to be expected, like if your players start using mechanics or elements you're not used to, they'll have at least a slight tactical advantage. Giving an alternative combat system a higher barrier of entry just makes designing its outcomes an easier, more reliable process, but it's understandable why some folks might get turned off by it. That's kind of a feature, not a bug. Well, it looks about time to head out. We'll be going in-depth on each table presented here later on, but I wanted to give you all a primer on weaponless combat and let you know it wasn't half as silly as folks made it out to be. It's the whole point of this series, rediscovering rules people misunderstood or thought were nonsensical at the time but can be used in our games today. Before you all go, be sure to check out our Kickstarter, Seven Willows, Y'all get to play a ranger in an RPG zine completely designed around them, and you get a neat mystery story to boot. It's also a demonstration of my approach to exploration rules, an alternative to games saying they do exploration. Guess what our next 5e retrospective is gonna be. It's easy to pick up too, and you can even play solo if that's your thing. Y'all know what to do if you want next week's 5e retrospective coming across your feed. And if you want to back Seven Willows, go on ahead and check out the link in the description. Well, folks, without further ado, peace.